Greetings, friends and fellow terrestrial beings, and welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and the scientists involved in our quest to understand the nature of life in the cosmos. We are brought to you by SeganNet.org and the NASA Astrobiology Program, and I am your host, Graham, the Cosmobiologist Lau. Hi, everyone. Uh, we have a really incredible guest for you this month, and I have to say, like, I've kind of been like geeking out in the background here, thinking about having him on. Uh, I've been following his work for a very long time, and we have a lot of cool stuff to talk about about Europa and working at JPL. Uh, just so much cool science and a really awesome book that just came out. But before we get to that, and I introduce our guest, we have some of our usual awesome things that we do with our show, like for instance, our field site challenge. As many of our audience members know, each month before the episode airs, uh, the day before we launch on Twitter, uh, a challenge for you to figure out some astrobiologically relevant field site here on our Earth. Uh, and this, the, the picture from this month we're putting up right now for you to see. This is an image of the Sully hydrothermal vent in the main Endeavor vent field uh, off the Juan de Fuca Ridge. This vent is some 2,200 meters underwater a region where fluids circulating into the crust come back out at hundreds of degrees Celsius, bringing out this black material in this hydrothermal vent, this black smoker chimney. Around the chimney is an oasis of life, including those long tube worms, the Riftia pachyptala. Uh, these sites are so important for us as astrobiologists. After their, their discovery in the 1970s, we realized that these hydrothermal vents could be sites not just for life to thrive in oases on ocean floors on earth and beyond but potential sites for the origins of life as well and so they've been crucial now to our understanding of how life functions and so our winner this month of all the wonderful correct answers we got on twitter about the location of this site is tristan caro uh, i actually know tristan tristan is a graduate student at the university of colorado uh, he's also a member of the research coordination network called enfold or the Network for Life Detection. So congratulations, Tristan, on winning. Uh, and thank you to all of you who've competed this month and every single month in our Field Site Challenge. We also do a monthly Ambassador of the Month, trying to celebrate those of you who go out of your way to give us some love in the digital realm through social media, on Twitter and Facebook, LinkedIn, Reddit, Instagram, and all the other awesome places you can share Ask an Astrobiologist. We actually had so many people this month sharing us that we wanted to, to name four of you specifically and say thank you for your hard work. Uh, those four are Emily Felder, uh, at Subatomic Emily on Twitter, uh, Anna Mahanti at Strayologist, Stina at Stina25062353, and Dilara Kalkarsland at Dobi Dila. Uh, on Twitter. Uh, thanks, thank you to the four of you. Uh, we really appreciate all that you do for our show. Now, without any further ado, I get to introduce this month's guest, Dr. Kevin Hand of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Dr. Kevin Hand, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks, Graham. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Um, like I said, I've been following your work for a long time, uh, and I know a lot about you. you know, since my, my own graduate research was in the realm of an understanding analogs for Europa and Enceladus and other worlds. Uh, but for our audience, you know, I'd really like to get to, you know, who you are as a scientist, what you do. You, you work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, you're involved in uh, upcoming research on developing a lander for Europa. Uh, but can you give us just a, a little background about your career in science and what led you to where you are right now? <laughs> Going back to the beginning, Graham? The whole, the whole, the whole way back. <laughs> um, yeah. So once upon a time, um, so I, I was uh, born and raised in a uh, pretty small town in southwestern Vermont, uh, a town called Manchester, Vermont. Um, and I uh, attribute my fascination, my obsession, my curiosity uh, with uh, the search for life beyond Earth to the, the clear night skies of Vermont and uh, having parents and, and living in a community where uh, all of us kids were just kind of kicked out uh, at sunrise and we had to come back uh, in time for, for dinner. Um, and so my, my siblings and I and, and my friends uh, and I, we all just kind of 
lived in the woods and played in mud puddles. It was um, <laughs> the, the best analogy for my childhood is uh, is basically Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I had my own beyond a, uh, a nurturing community and uh, friends and family who just kind of uh, let us all roam. I had a, a wonderful teacher in seventh and eighth grade, a science teacher who was adamant about just getting us out and having us explore and build things. Uh, his name was Mike Seperon, and he, uh, uh, he got us out into these old cow pastures in Vermont and these old rivers uh, where there had been water wheels and sawmills that were powered by simple machines uh, and that um, really gave a sense for what early technology in colonial America was was like. And so that kind of captivated my imagination with the the basic um, physics of the world uh, around me, and then uh, combine that with the the night sky above, uh, and add in some Carl Sagan books, uh, and building a lot of rockets. Um, yeah, it. Uh, I just feel very fortunate that I grew up in a in an environment that was nurturing, but also, um, well, there's an interesting kind of compare and contrast. Some people have a a childhood where they have academic parents and they get like streamlined on on this thing and that thing. I I didn't have that. And obviously having parents who know what a PhD is or who are into academia can get you on that path very quickly. But I worry that sometimes those folks are not necessarily choosing their their, uh, their path, uh, and so uh, I feel very fortunate that I kind of organically came to love uh, the universe around me, and and that did result in some challenges in terms of how the heck do I make a career out of this? Um, and we can get into some of that, but, uh, but the seeds were planted by just the, the sort of, uh, fertile soil of Vermont, so to speak. No, that's awesome. I have to say, you know, as, as a parent myself with a young child, you know, I've been thinking a lot about ways to, to be supportive, but also not to like, you know, to shoehorn him into like some path that I want for him and, you know, to, to give him that chance. So it's, it's kind of cool to hear about that. You know, you have a, an environment that, that nurtures and challenges you, but doesn't, you know, direct you necessarily, uh, mm-hmm. where to go. Uh, so, so, uh, tell us then about, about your, your career, kind of your adventure going into, into college and, and what you studied and how it kind of brought you to be the scientist that you are. Well, well how old is your, your child? Uh, he's 10 months old right now. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Yeah. He's, be- he's very early in this day. Yeah. Uh, I was going to recommend, uh, mud puddles and cardboard boxes. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I definitely made a lot of forts and spaceships out of refrigerator boxes and, uh, anything that, uh, uh, that my siblings and I could crawl into. Um, yeah. So the, uh, with regard to how I got from, from there to, to where I am now, there's many, many steps, uh, that, that probably take a lot, a lot longer than we, we have today, but, um, originally I wanted to go to Cornell and study under Carl Sagan. And, and I, that I, I got into Cornell and, and I really didn't have much guidance as far as how to become a scientist. Uh, a lot of kids in, in public schools in Vermont are just kind of, well, go to UVM, which is a great school. Um, but there, there wasn't too much guidance about, oh, I want to become a scientist. Well, <laughs> Sorry, uh, I should mention, um, I, I was sort of morally opposed to the cost of, of college back then, uh, which uh, this is this is the early 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously, this has become a, a huge issue in the modern era. But uh, during junior high and high school, I, uh, well, actually it goes back even further than that, but as a young child, I, I got captivated also by uh, magic and, and some of the, uh, the uh, juggling and riding unicycles and all that stuff. Uh, and I think magic and magic tricks uh, can definitely get your, your sort of childhood OCD going on um, 
know, if you've got a curious mind that's obsessed with puzzles and figuring things out, and then you see a magic trick that just does not make sense with the universe around you, uh, you, you can obsess over those things. So I definitely um, got hooked on magic as a, as a young kid, and then I ended up starting a a small business where I went around with a buddy of mine and, and we did birthday parties and uh, senior living homes and uh, VFW um, holiday parties and things like that. Um, I bought my first car with money I made from the magic shows and everything. So there was actually a time period where I looked at going to um, uh, a circus college uh, and I had actually gone to magic camp. Uh, and so there was a, there's a whole kind of alternate universe where I, where I pursued all of that. Um, mm. but then I got into Cornell and uh, I ended up having some, some scholarships and some financial aid that, um, made college possible. Um, and when I went out to Cornell and visited, I talked with a physics professor there and he said, there's no way you're ever going to meet Carl. There's no way you're ever going to get a chance to work with him. Um, and so I kind of, I left Cornell and, and was a bit sad. And uh, my English teacher had advised that I look at Dartmouth College. Uh, and I went to Dartmouth. I didn't like it on my first trip because I did the sort of standard tour. Uh, and I didn't like a bunch of the sort of Greek life aspect of all that. Uh, but then I went back up there on my own and met a bunch of the uh, mountaineering club and outing club folks. And I had a great talk with a physics professor there who um, uh, was not at all condescending. He, he entertained all my naive questions about general relativity and quantum mechanics and all that. So I ended up going to Dartmouth and studied physics and psychology and astronomy there. Uh, and then from there, there, there were a number of internships and, and hiccups here and there that we can get into if you like. But that's sort of how I went from a, a child to then being actually engaged in a formal academic system that, that would eventually lead to me being at JPL. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And it's hard to imagine that, you know, this, this universe where Kevin Hand is, you know, the master of ledger domain and you know, <laughs> a, a magician. <laughs> it's kind of cool, though. I, 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 like, I like hearing that, that story in your background, you know, that there is this interest in magic and, and developing that kind of as a career. Um, and also the enchantment that comes with that and kind of the awe and wonder of this world of magic that, you know, kind of draws a lot of people to it. We also have that a lot in astrobiology and in the sciences um, as well. Um, so, you know, you work currently at JPL, which is like the mecca of space exploration. Um, can you just give our audience like an idea of, you know, what a general day, I mean, we're in pandemic right now, obviously, but, but what is the, the, the life of a JPL scientist like? Um, well, obviously I can really only speak for myself, but in general, um, the, uh, scientists at JPL, we have to publish or perish and, uh, we kind of partition our, our workload into fundamental research and writing proposals to support that fundamental research and then doing mission work. So, um, uh, helping either lead or, or formulate or implement missions. In other words, help get missions uh, approved or um, help get missions built or some combination there. And in my case, I run the Ocean Worlds lab at JPL and we've got a great team in that lab and we do these experiments that simulate Europa's surface and subsurface, Enceladus's surface and subsurface and a little bit of Titan work in there. Um, I also do a fair amount of earth, ice, and ocean work uh, in our lab. And so part of my time is spent on lab and, and writing up those results. Uh, part of my time uh, is spent right now on Mars 2020. I'm helping as a, a member of the, the Sherlock instrument team. Uh, and then the other major component of my time is trying to get the Europa lander mission concept moving forward. We passed our Delta MCR, our mission concept review, which is a gate to go to phase A, the, the kind of official green light for a mission to move forward. But through a number of different factors, we're kind of 
uh, in a parking orbit, if you will, and that mission will not move forward. I'm certain it certainly won't move into phase A before the next decadal survey is uh, completed and distributed. Uh, and so to that end, we need the astrobiology community out there to get involved with the decadal survey and to uh, help be a strong voice for our priorities in uh, the next decade of exploration and hopefully getting things like a lander to the surface of Europa, uh, a mission out to study the plumes of Enceladus, uh, and all those things. So I spent a lot of time on that kind of mission development work um, and the uh, uh, the formulation and strategy side. And then I'm a co-I on Europa Clipper and a co-I on the Dragonfly mission, uh, and I do a fair amount of field work. So it's, uh, it's a lot to juggle, but... Uh, um, and try and keep all the balls in the air. Yeah, so it sounds like a very busy life, but also really exciting to be involved in all of these incredible missions and all these you know cool things that could be happening in the near future. Um, for our audience who aren't aware, the Decadal Survey, uh, which has you know, always been about planetary science, now it's the Decadal Survey of Planetary Science and Astrobiology, uh, which is pretty incredible. Uh, this is a, a way for the community to come together as researchers and basically say within one large uh, document kind of, you know, this is the vision for the next 10 years of our exploration in this realm. Um, so it'd be very cool if we can get, you know, the Europa lander concept in there and, and you know, getting a mission to Enceladus. Um, before we talk more about all these missions specifically, I do want to mention your book, uh, which I had seen, you know, you'd mentioned on Twitter it was being released. And that's when I, I wanted to bring you on the show was to, was to talk about this. Uh, that is Alien Oceans for our audience. Um, you can pick this book up now. Um, unfortunately, it's hard with the pandemic to go to bookstores and find it, but it is available online. Um, I've really enjoyed it thus far. Uh, and one place I want to start during graduate school um, to join a trip, James Cameron, to go down into a submersible in the ocean, not just once, but I think nine times uh, you mentioned you had a chance to go down. Uh, what was that like for you, uh, that experience of, of becoming one of the very few humans who's ever gone down to the bottom of the ocean in a submersible. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, uh, it was uh, remarkable and and, and mind altering and and uh, and all of those uh, aspects. I'll get into the actual experience in a in a second. But uh, as I as I describe in the book, it was not an obvious choice for me at the time. Uh, I was out at the geobiology summer school on Catalina Island, um, and. Uh, this was a, a TV thing, a Hollywood thing or whatever, and I had done a little bit of work here and there uh, with that and for the most part kind of saw that as a distraction. Um, but uh, my uh, close friend, George Whitesides, who was at some other, he was at a, a dot-com space company at the time, he called me up and said, uh, James Cameron is looking at making uh, connecting hydrothermal vents to Europa and he's looking for young scientists to talk about uh, that connection well at the And so I said, well, OK, sounds interesting. But then I went and they kind of interviewed me and stuff and that it went well. And I was thinking you know, because I had this great thing at the geobiology summer school. <laughs> um, and I asked Ken Nielsen, who uh, many of you uh, know of Ken, uh, Ken's at USC. Uh, and he's just an incredible stalwart in the field. And I was like, Ken, should I should I do this thing? Is this a distraction? Is it is it you know I'm in the PhD. Uh, this is going to be some time off. And he uh, put his hand on my shoulder and just said, Kevin, if there's any chance in hell you get to go to the bottom of the ocean, damn it, take it. <laughs> and uh, that was that was really really good advice. Uh, and so, yeah, I got to go to the bottom, uh, nine times and see hydrothermal vents up close, uh, to see those bizarre and beautiful ecosystems, uh, right in front of my eyes. And it, um, uh, it was just absolutely stunning. And, and it's, it's sort of folded into a philosophy of robots versus human exploration and having grown up in the mountains and, and done a lot of climbing and mountaineering and, and getting out into the mountains. Uh, it, there were interesting parallels with being down at the bottom of the ocean and that, that sense of awe. Uh, I, you know, obviously, it kind of leaves me speechless, but I describe it in the book and uh, uh, I, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything in the world. 
That's wonderful. Kind of reminds me of you know that the, the you know Frank White sure. coined this term in 1987 that you know less than 600 humans so far have gone into space and, and you pass the Kármán line in the orbit. And, and look down at our Earth from above, but in some ways you had a very similar experience by going down to the bottom of the ocean in a submersible, which you know also very few humans have done. And you know it's it's a very you know a, a place we humans don't you know we, we didn't evolve to live in such kind of environments. And so you know, it's kind of staggering to think about you know the fact that we can send people uh, to those places to explore. Yeah, and in the same way that the overview effect, which is up on my bookshelf here somewhere, it's a uh, an old classic. In the same way that the overview effect is conceived of as a way to potentially transform our understanding of our place uh, on planet Earth and in the in the cosmos, in a way to maybe catalyze some altruistic behavior to to get us to be um, uh, to see uh, a world without borders. Uh, um, the, that kind of immersive experience, I think. Uh, connects back to, to the deep ocean exploration. And it seems like right now, you know, with the pandemic as well, it's, it's a good time for us to to have people who've had those experiences sharing that, you know, and so with you sharing it through your book, you know, and other people who have had these awesome experiences sharing it now with others around the globe, now that we're all connecting more online, you know, it's a chance for all of us to get into this conversation about our responsibility towards our planet. Um, yeah. Yes, it's very cool. Um, so, I mean, I, I love Europa. It's it's my favorite of the icy worlds of our solar system. Uh, you do a really good job in the book kind of explaining this slow, uh, methodical process that we went through to discover that Europa has an ocean down below, a very deep ocean um, down below, and, and could even have some life inside of it. Um, I don't want to give away too much from inside the book, but I, I do love that there's a chapter in the book where you kind of start talking about some of the potential biology that could occur in Europa's ocean. Um, I recall uh, Carol Cleland, the philosopher, she loves to always joke that there might be whales inside of Europa. Um, and so I wonder if you could like give us a vision um, of, of your own, if you could. Uh, if there is a biosphere in Europa, what does that look like to you? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, as you know, I love this, this chat. My, uh, one of the most fun chapters for me to write was this chapter called The Octopus and the Hammer. Uh, and, uh, uh, that way, so I, I wrote this book in part for the 15 to 25 year old version of me that, uh, wanted some detail, uh, uh, wanted some equations, wanted, some, you know, wanted to be challenged, uh, with, with, with really hard science, but I also wanted the book to have some speculative fun and that's where uh that chapter really comes into play and, and this actually links back to uh, a question that that's one uh of um, somebody in, in your audience asked I'm, I'm forgetting his name about uh, why i studied psychology and i studied psychology in college in part because i was fascinated with with human consciousness and and how we even uh understand our place in the universe uh, and also with what it would mean for organisms on distant planets or distant moons to evolve their sensory modalities. Uh, everything that we know and love and understand about our universe comes through our five senses. And yet, of course, whales, dolphins, bees, um, uh, various kinds of fish have senses that we don't have. And if they were to evolve to consciousness, how would those different sensory modalities affect their perception of, of the universe around them? So I go into to some detail on that in that chapter. And within Europa, um, uh, sorry, I'm jumping around here a little bit. Uh, Within Europa, there is the potential that we could have larger organisms. And so um, the, the radiation bombardment of Europa's surface generates oxygen. We, we, we know that solid phase oxygen exists in Europa's ice. And if that oxygen is cycled into the ocean below, then there is the possibility that we could, that, that Europa's ocean could support multicellular life. 
Um, uh, obviously, for the most part, when we talk about the search for life elsewhere, we're talking about the search for even the, the tiniest of microbe. But Europa's got this pretty unique situation where the radiation chemistry on the surface could play a role in a very uh, an ocean with a lot of chemical disequilibrium, uh, uh, a significant amount of that could then motivate a sort of Cambrian explosion uh, or Europa's version of a Cambrian explosion, which could potentially lead to organisms uh, like octopi or squid or cuttlefish. Uh, as much as I love whales, keep in mind, of course, that whales had to come on land and back. Same with dolphins. So let's imagine that you have octopi or some European version of octopi within Europa, or for that matter, some distant version of Europa that's orbiting some other star. Uh, you know, the, the the nice thing about Europas is that they they might be ubiquitous in our galaxy and our universe. So somewhere they're probably, well, I shouldn't say probably, but I would predict that there is multicellular life within some ice-covered ocean world out there in our galaxy. Then you can ask, would it develop the tool-using capability that, uh, that uh, early hominids did? Uh, would it develop a consciousness and a philosophy or a religion akin to what our own pathway from Australopithecus has, has yielded? And then one of my favorite thoughts is um, much of our philosophy has been driven by our capacity to look up and see the night sky, uh, the, the moon, the stars, the sun to explore. Uh, we've been able to look over the horizon, watch the sun dip over the horizon, watch it rise again. Same with the moon. We've been able to see the stars uh, circle around us and then realize we are, are circle around, circling around a star. If you're an intelligent octopus beneath an ice shell on Europa, you're not looking up and seeing the, the stars. You are hearing the creaks and cracks of that ice shell echoing throughout your ocean. And those creaks and cracks are connected to the tides that result from this moon orbiting a giant world like, like Jupiter in the case of Europa. And so I love to just think about how consciousness and philosophy and potentially religion and, and a sense of place would develop in a uh, an intelligent creature within an ice covered ocean that has no access to the stars above. So that's part of what I get into in that chapter. And uh, uh, yeah, again, yeah. that's that was a fun chapter for me to write because I got to kind of uh, speculate on a lot of these uh, fun but deep ideas. Well, I'll tell you for for a reader, it's also very fun as well. You know, in my mind, I was just envisioning, you know, this crackling of an ice shell and what that would, would do for, for this, you know, these beings if they were creating their own mythologies, their own culture, their own understanding of themselves in a cosmos they can't, you know, they can't perceive because it's, you know, through 10 kilometers or more of ice. Um, so that was really cool for me. Um, one thing for our audience, um, we are going to open up the audience questions here really soon. Uh, for those watching on SegaNet on Facebook, uh, you can just drop your questions into the chat and we'll pick them up. Uh, you can also ask questions using hashtag AskAstroBio on Twitter as usual, uh, and we'll open it up here very soon. Uh, I have one more question of my own, and then we'll, we'll start asking audience questions. Uh, so, Kevin, for uh, one, one thing I, I really don't like myself right now in the realm of astrobiology is this use of the term habitable zone, um, because it, it seems presumptive, you know, that it seems like we're telling, you know, people around the world that we're only going to find habitation by alien life inside of this zone around a star, um, but you, you know, you present very compelling arguments in your book for potential for life in icy worlds and ocean worlds in our solar system. And it seems likely that there's probably more ocean worlds with icy surfaces than there are terrestrial worlds uh, in our galaxy, so more potential in those oceans. Uh, so, so how do you think, what do you think about this term habitable zone? Uh, how does that apply to your own thinking when you're thinking about potential for life in these worlds that aren't anywhere close to that habitable zone? Right. Yeah. So the, the traditional habitable zone, as you're, you're alluding to, is that one where the energy for maintaining liquid water oceans comes from 
uh, your parent star. Uh, if you're too close, like Venus, you're too hot. If you're too far away, like Mars, you're too cold. If you're at the Earth sun sun distance, then you're uh, you're in just the right region. You're in the habitable zone. Now, obviously, uh, the story is much more complex than that, but um, but nevertheless, this kind of old Goldilocks scenario, the traditional habitable zone, is pretty limiting when we think about the vast volume of real estate that exists within our own solar system, within uh, the the realms of these ice covered. Uh, alien oceans of the outer solar system. And so it may be that uh, when you add up the amount of liquid water within Europa's ocean, Elvis's ocean, Titan's ocean, Ganymede, Callisto, uh, possibly Titania, Miranda, uh, maybe even Mimas and Pluto, um, there may be upwards of 50 times the volume of liquid water within these oceans of the outer solar system as there is found here on Earth. Now, of course, liquid water is not um, sufficient to uh, to provide for life as we know it, but it is a, a, a necessary condition for life as we know it. Uh, and so that much uh, liquid water uh, is certainly changing the way we think about uh, what it means for a world to be habitable and how much habitable real estate might be out there uh, beyond our solar system. Mm, exactly. So uh, it's an interesting thing. You know, I, I think our, our thinking is changing more and more the more we realize these worlds could be potentially inhabited with life um, as we know it, or maybe life as we don't know it for some places like Titan. Um, but before, you know, we, we, we go ahead. Well, well just uh, another critical aspect there that, that is part of kind of the framework of any ocean worlds program and part of what our, what our, um, uh, some of the key motivation has been is that the ocean worlds of the outer solar system present an opportunity to search for and possibly find extant life, life that is alive today. Why is that important? Um, I love Mars. I, I do some work on Mars. Uh, Mars is a, is a beautiful place. Uh, but our search for life on Mars, at, uh, at least in its current inception, is a search for past life. And the Curiosity rover could turn a corner in, uh, uh, on Mount Sharp tomorrow and find stromatolites, and that would, that would be uh, revolutionary. Uh, everybody would, would jump up and down, and it would be amazing. But as we know from stromatolites here on Earth, uh, the, these bed forms of, uh, of possible indications of, of past microbial activity on, on Earth, the large biomolecules of life do not last long in the rock record. So you can't, cannot easily go to a stromatolite and find um, a fragment of DNA. Uh, and so on Mars, we might find fossil evidence of past life but then we would have a very limited capability to understand its biochemistry. These ocean worlds of the outer solar system are places where liquid water exists today and where we could eventually uh, find living life and study its biochemistry, see whether or not it runs on DNA, RNA, proteins, ATP, or if there's some other game in town. And, and so that's part of what I find so compelling about these these ocean worlds, the prospect of finding extant life where we can truly understand its biochemistry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, comparative biology would be a game changer, right? Not just for for looking at different biomolecules and things like that, but understanding this, this idea, like what is life? Yeah, you know, maybe we can't currently define life, but maybe, maybe if we had another example, we actually would have something to work against. Yeah, um, it's rather incredible. Um, I do want to open it up now to the audience questions. I'm, I'm seeing that we actually have a lot of them already. Uh, so again, for those of you watching, please ask your questions in SegaNet uh, on the Facebook page um, or on Twitter using hashtag AskAstroBio. Uh, let's start off here with a question from uh, Tarta Grauda, uh, at Just Grauda on Twitter. Uh, she says, uh, I was wondering how you decided to become an astrobiologist, which we discussed a little bit. Um, and then also, do you have any advice for young students who want to pursue a career in this very vast field? Yeah, this is a great question. I might spend a fair amount of time on this one, Graham, because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really important one. Um, I've got loads and loads of stories of the, the trials and tribulations of, of, uh, of 
my own path. Uh, and but I do want to mention, I mean, th- this is my own path. Listen, let's state the obvious. I'm a white male, uh, and and I was becoming an astrobiologist in the in the mid to late '90s. Um, and so, uh, you know, I can't even imagine what it's like uh, for for anyone coming without that kind of advantage of of, of being a white male, especially back uh, back in those days. Um, but nevertheless, the the trials and tribulations that I experienced are just kind of the tip of the iceberg um, uh, for these challenges. So um, uh, having said that, astrobiology was not a field when I was uh, an undergrad. Uh, The kind of uh, canonical astrobiology is now a thing, goes back to the ALH 84001 timeframe in roughly 1997 or so. Uh, And actually there's a, let's see. Where is this from? This is 1999. So this is a key article on astrobiology from Jerry Soffin. And Jerry Soffin was the project scientist for the Viking missions. Uh, and Jerry was uh, just a, 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 a real mensch. And he formed the NASA Astrobiology Academy. And in 1997, they started an astrobiology branch of the NASA uh, Academy at NASA Ames. And I applied to that as an undergrad. When I first saw that, and this is back in the days when the internet was not that that prevalent, uh, and so there was a website for it, and they had a little Europa melt probe. Um, but uh, I applied to that program and was so excited about it. And I just so happened the day before the application was due, I had long since sent off my application. I called to check to make sure that my application had been received. And the person on the other end who answered, uh, Doug O'Hanley, who who ran that program, well, I don't have any application with that name on it. Uh, No, uh, sorry, uh, I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) So I, uh, I was devastated. But I ended up calling around and trying to figure out what happened to my application. And it turned out that it was sitting on the desk of somebody at the local New Hampshire space grant. And that person had been on vacation or something, and they were supposed to turn it into NASA more broadly. And, and uh, But that never happened. Thankfully, the person at the New Hampshire space grant then uh, faxed it on to, to the folks at Ames. Uh, And so my application made it in time to to be considered. Uh, I'd like to use that that story just to emphasize uh, the need for persistence. Um, Had I never followed up and just sort of checked on, you know, just a stupid thing, just check on on my application and make sure it was received at the other end. Had I never checked on that, I never would have heard from the program. I would have thought that I was just rejected outright. Uh, and I would have uh, been really sad since it seemed like that astrobiology program was uh, uh, was exactly what I what I wanted to do. Um, so that that was the first internship that I did, uh, the Astrobiology Academy back in 1997, uh, and that helped build uh, some other bridges towards uh, eventually working at at JPL. Um, and uh, if we have time, there's a there's a nice story with I met Jill Tarter during that internship, and, and she kind of uh, gave me some good advice. Um, and uh, but onto some logistics for for students, and th- this kind of falls into a bit of my experience with with, with Jill. Um, I'll go through just a couple of things, and and these points are ones that I've developed over years of, of talking with students and, and trying to distill out some, some good advice. First and foremost is to find your question. Um, astrobiology is, by its nature, broad and can be somewhat vague. And I often get students say, you know, I want to develop spectroscopic biosignatures. I want to do this thing or that thing. That's, that's not really a question. Figure out your question, uh, and then uh, some of these other aspects kind of come out of really developing your question. Uh, And to that end, if you're going to pursue a PhD, you need to be very 
specific and make sure that your question is framed as an hypothesis. Because really doing a PhD is about uh, adding new knowledge to the canon of knowledge that is out there on a specific topic. Uh, and uh, a PhD really is kind of a, uh, a test of your ability to advance human knowledge, even by just a tiny increment. Uh, and so you really have to dedicate yourself to it. Uh, you have to make a, a concrete scientific contribution before broadening out. And, and all too often I see that happening in astrobiology where, where people broaden out too soon uh, and really they, they should stay specific at least through your PhD, maybe use your postdoc as an opportunity to broaden. Um, now that said, if you're having a hard time finding your question, <laughs> then my recommendation is to become a microbiologist or an oceanographer. And I say that because uh, in part, right, I wish that I had gone on that path. Uh, I studied physics and astronomy and I have no regrets on that, but my goodness, microbiology and oceanography, there's so much great work to be done that is really valuable for understanding Earth's biosphere and Earth as a planet. And you can then bridge to astrobiology quite, quite easily. Uh, and so I, I advise students to go into those fields if they are still kind of in, in search mode. Uh, there's a lot of low-hanging low scientific fruit. There are exciting fields. Uh, you can get out into the field on a cruise. You can get data easily. <laughs> and that's important, at least compared to planetary science. You can get data easily if you go into microbiology or oceanography. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, don't become an astrobiologist too early. Specialize and make a concrete scientific contribution before, um, um, uh, before broadening. And to that end, I took time off in between undergrad and grad school. Uh, I worked at NASA Ames. Uh, I went, I hitchhiked uh, around the US and, and around Europe and Russia and Africa. Uh, I juggled to make money on the sides of streets when I needed a little little cash for food and, and things. Uh, life is short. Um, and uh, so it, if you have any doubts, take some time off. Really, the only time that you're going to be able to, to take off is between undergrad and graduate school. And as long as you make sure that you do something somewhat productive in that time frame, uh, you'll, you, you'll be able to apply to grad school without that time off being a, a, a negative on your application. I uh, work for a year in a lab, uh, go uh, uh, work as a ship hand on, uh, on a research vessel or something like that uh, to, to kind of explore what interests you and what kind of opportunities exist. Um, and let's see, just lastly, well, oh goodness, so many things, Graham. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say mentor above all. Um, and I've, uh, seek out somebody who inspires you. Uh, again, life is too short. Um, <laughs> life is too short to work with a jerk, uh, simply put. Um, and, uh, uh, I think my friend John Spear uh, has, has said something along the lines of, of that. Uh, and work with somebody who inspires you, who also you know, will, will help um, uh, cultivate your interest in, in science. Um, and that may take some time to, to kind of search around and, and find somebody who's pursuing questions that interest you and somebody who's a human being with whom you want to work. Uh, and I spent quite a bit of time searching around, and I had a couple of different uh, options. Um, and so that, that sort of connects back to Jill Tarter. When I was a, an, uh, an intern at NASA Ames, Jill came and gave a talk to our Astrobiology Academy. And at the end, she kind of made this offhand comment, if you ever want to come to the SETI Institute and, and see how we search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, feel free to come by. Okay. And truth be told, I think she kind of said it, not thinking anybody would follow up. But I had grown up obsessed with SETI. I had gotten there little newsletters that they would occasionally send out in the mail. Um, and 
So I, I walked and took a bus and eventually found my way to Landings Drive, which is where the, the original SETI Institute was. And went up to the, the counter there. And I think Edna DeVore um, was at the, uh, at the counter. And I, I said, oh, Jill Tarter mentioned that, you know, I can maybe see some of the computers where you're generating the waterfall plots and everything. And so Edna went to, to check on Jill. And Jill came out and she was a little bit frazzled at the time, and, uh, but graciously brought me in and said, just sit here and watch. And it turns out that I had happened to uh, stop by in 1997 during, there was some sort of anomaly with the SOHO satellite that was a, that was a big possible signal. Uh, they didn't know it was SOHO at the time. And so Jill was very patient with me and just kind of occasionally saying, this is what you're seeing. This is exciting. Just stay quiet. And um, we've got champagne in the, uh, in the fridge over there just in case everything goes. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yeah. But so, um, uh, yeah, Jill had kind of uh, taken pity on me and then uh, connected me up with uh, a couple of other folks. And eventually that led to me meeting uh, Christopher Chaiba, who then later became my PhD advisor. Uh, so that's the abbreviated version. Nice. Yeah. Oh, my we, we actually had Joel on the show uh, just last year. Uh, and it's cool that that was during the NASA Academy. For, for me, uh, I was in the NASA Academy at Ames in 2007, and mm -hmm. it was meeting Peter Diamandis uh, of the XPRIZE Foundation, Zero G Corporation. Uh, yeah, he kind of inspired me to then continue my career in a different way. I had degrees in biology and chemistry, and he kind of inspired me to then pursue astrophysics and geology in graduate school, which I ended up doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's pretty cool. And actually, I have Doug O'Hanley's signature on a guitar sitting right here beside me. Oh, uh, for our audience who are unaware, Doug passed away some years ago. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we lost him. Um, but yeah, so it's a wonderful answer for everyone, everyone watching. Uh, unfortunately, the NASA Academy has changed a lot these past several years. So there's not really the Astrobiology Academy like there used to be, but there still are lots of opportunities for undergraduates uh, here in the U.S., we also have the NSF Research Experiences for Undergraduates program, or RU program. Uh, if you're interested in microbiology and that kind of stuff, you can apply for those as well. Um, but we do have a lot of questions, and so I'm going to try to jump into a few more of those if we can here, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mo Nasser from SeganNet asks, uh, so being at the bottom of the ocean in, that, in those submarines, um, how did that feel on a personal level, and did it change any of your ideals or, or morals about you know, your place in the world? Uh, that, that, that's interesting. I, I, it, um, uh, I, I don't think it necessarily changed anything more than uh, really codified things in a in a much different realm. Um, uh, as I mentioned in the book, I, I grew up in the mountains and and had that kind of. Um, I'm not a religious person, but I'm spiritual and the kind of uh, um, love the connection with nature and have always been able to read the trees and the clouds and the mountains. Um, but out at sea, I didn't know how to do that. It was uh, it was unsettling initially. Uh, and this is just being on a ship where I, where, where I could not where it's surrounded by uh, by ocean. This isn't even getting into the depths of the ocean. And so that experience of learning how to read the ocean, learning how, what the clouds were telling me uh, uh, out at sea, learning what the waves were saying, uh, and then getting down into the, uh, the depths of the ocean really was a different dimension of the same kind of connection to the natural world that I experienced just hiking through mud puddles back home in Vermont. So it was, it was more of like a extending the axes as opposed to um, uh, something entirely new. Nice, yeah. So for our viewers, get out there and explore. Get, get into nature. <laughs> yeah. um, another question. So uh, Anarup Mahanti uh, at Strayologist on Twitter asks, uh, and this is a, a Clipper question, uh, what are the biggest challenges we face uh, during the Europa Clipper mission? So uh, the the main answer that, that is given to, to that question is the radiation environment of, of Jupiter and the, uh, the environment around Europa. Um, and so that's, uh, that's challenging, but I'll tell you, as a scientist, I find a tremendous amount of 
inspiration from the engineers with whom I work. Uh, I don't know how many engineers we have listening, but um, or or, or uh, blossoming engineers. But please go into engineering, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of great engineering that astrobiology needs. Uh, we scientists are the um, are are the uh, the crazy fools with the big questions and we count on the engineers to uh solve the problems uh the, the pragmatic problems of what it actually takes to get out there to these worlds uh and, and answer these questions so on the clipper mission it has just been tremendous to see the engineers uh tackle and solve uh, the radiation problem as well as uh, ways in which to have all the different instruments co-bore sided so they can all collect data that couples together quite well like a Russian doll. Um, and so it really is a remarkable mission. The uh, trajectory team has just given this, this wonderful tour that will do these flybys with close approaches that will kind of um, almost like a hula hoop going around different parts of your belly uh, you'll get a close approach uh, on different regions of Europa. Uh, and so uh, it's it's an incredibly exciting mission. I just hope we can get it to the launch pad sooner as opposed to later. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really excited for Clipper. There's a lot of science to get out of that. But you're right, though. I mean, that engineering is incredible. Some of these things that we've been doing on, on Mars and you know, sending probes out to other worlds and outside of our solar system, it's just incredible to think of. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I should mention, Graham, uh, just uh, – Really, please do consider, uh, if you're interested in astrobiology, consider the fields of engineering. Uh, in many ways, my engineering friends at JPL kind of have a a more fun life. Uh, uh, they've got a hard life. But um, even though all that stuff that I described earlier, running a lab, uh, helping them be a part of missions, uh, all of that, even though that sounds exciting, it's really important, especially for young students, to appreciate that a lot of being a scientist is not fun. <laughs> it's um, uh, writing proposals, getting rejections. Uh, I like to say failure has to be an option. Uh, I have failed so many times. Um, I have submitted countless proposals to the ROSES program. Uh, failure, failure, failure. I've submitted countless proposals to instruments to be on missions. I've been on a lot of mission proposals that have not been selected. Failure has to be an option. You have to learn not to take these things personally. You have to learn just to pick yourself up off the floor, <laughs> you know, count on certain friends who can help uh, pull the little marionette strings to help get you up off the floor. Um, and so being a scientist, whether it's in astrobiology or in any other field, is a difficult life. Do not choose that that path lightly. Mm -hmm. um, I love it, but trust me, it's it's miserable uh, for a decent fraction of the time. You really have to be obsessed with this stuff and be willing to make the sacrifices that come along with all the failure and rejection and stuff that you'll face. So, yeah, that's very, yeah, and, very, very powerful advice for our audience. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to sound depressing, in that sense, but, but meanwhile, not that engineers have it uh, easy, but the life of an engineer at JPL is one where they work in very close knit teams. The structure is such that they um, they get assigned to a mission. They have less autonomy. They don't they don't necessarily get to decide their own fate. Well, I mean, come on, at JPL, you're working on Mars 2020 or Europa Clipper or hopefully someday a, a Europa Lander, um, and they don't have to write proposals. They don't have to publish. Uh, they don't face all that rejection that we scientists face, and yet they get to solve some of the really hard problems, or they get to tackle some of those really hard problems. And so uh, I just want folks to, to not think of just the sciences, but also of the engineering aspects of what it takes for NASA missions to get done, and in particular, astrobiology missions. Definitely. Yeah, there, there's so much that we can do together when engineering and scientists kind of come together and make these things happen. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, and so I do want to pop in a few more questions here. Um, this one's from Rohan Shiam Chowdhury uh, on Twitter, at Rohan S. Chowdhury. 
Uh, and they ask, uh, suppose we find life in one of these alien oceans. What's what's the next step? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I like to say that you know, it's not going to change the way you make your coffee in the morning. It's, it's not going to shorten your commute. <laughs> um, but I spend a chapter in the book on this this concept that I like to frame as as a periodic table for life. Um, think about what it was like for the early chemists, Lavoisier, um, Mendeleev, et cetera, who were studying the elements and what it was like for them to uh, to just have oxygen. Uh, uh, oxygen didn't quite make sense and our atomic theory for matter didn't quite fully click into place until we had a periodic table of the elements and we could see how they were, were related uh, and how they, uh, they could connect with each other. I love to think about a similar framework, perhaps existing out there in our universe somewhere where there is a periodic table for life, some great tree of life that gives us a pattern for the different biochemistries and the different ways in which life works. And this connects back to, you know, defining an element in part took the periodic table. So perhaps defining life and understanding what life truly is will require discovering life elsewhere if it exists and putting it into a framework of a periodic table. And so I love to think also that perhaps elsewhere in the galaxy, there is a classroom where those students are in a civilization that has already discovered life beyond their home planet. And on the side of that classroom is not just a periodic table of the elements, but also a periodic table of life. And they are just looking at other examples out there. Maybe they already know of life here on earth. Uh, maybe they don't. And maybe someday we will be notched into a little section of that chart that they have on their wall. Mm. Let's just say it's not like a glass menagerie where they have like a human <laughs> inside of a box. <laughs> but no, I, I love that idea. Um, yeah, again, comparative biology would be just so huge for us. Yeah. Um, we are at the top of the hour. Um, if you have time, can we ask one more question? Sure, yeah. Okay, so, um, and this question uh, is from a longtime audience member, Tom Caruso, uh, and it kind of takes my mind down to our oceans and makes me think about some of these weird, you know, mid-ocean rivers and, you know, weird weird basins in the, on the ocean floor of different kind of uh, brine levels of fluids. Uh, so Tom wants to know that uh, if it's possible that ice brine channels in the bottom of an alien ocean or uh, the alien ocean, ocean ice shells, uh, if they could satisfy the criteria for the origin of life. Um, so gradients amongst minerals, salts, pH, those kind of things, um, what your view of that would be? Yeah, my short answer is yes. I think there's a lot of interesting potential there. Uh, Mike Russell, Allison Murray, and I uh, uh, wrote a, a paper in Astrobiology uh, uh, about this, and it's something that we're looking at here on Earth, these, these brinicles and, and how those chemical gradients uh, may provide some interesting catalytic surfaces and, and chemistry that could uh, help with the um, uh, the pathway to the origin of life. So I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the realm of, of cold origins. Mm, awesome. Well, I think we're going to sum it up there. We actually have a lot more questions. So for all of our viewers, uh, if they want to reach out to you, where, where's the best way for them to find you online? Um, it, at Alien Oceans uh, is my Twitter handle. Uh, I'm not very good on Twitter. Uh, um, I, my thumbs are too big or something, but the, uh, 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 I try and uh, be somewhat responsive on there. Uh, I just also have a hard time with uh, the, the character limit and all that stuff, but I'll do my best. Awesome. Yeah. So for all of you watching, thank you so much for all your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to that many of them. Uh, please reach out to Dr. Kevin Hand online. Please read his book, Alien Oceans. It's a fantastic read. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, and when you're going forward this month and thinking about astrobiology, uh, what is what are the, the, the major uh, challenges in the engineering for us to do the astrobiology, what we want to do uh, for our, our audience members? Why not reach out to us? Uh, at segannet.org, uh, at segannet.org on Twitter. Let us know what your thoughts are. What are the big challenges for us to do 
to bring science and engineering together to solve these problems in the future. Uh, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks, Graham. Anytime. Uh, uh, happy to come back and answer more questions. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember, stay curious. Stay curious.